John Chalice. Saying that now. Yeah. You don't know what you're going to get yourself into, John. <laughs> so, John, how's your day been? Well, uh, I, I've enjoyed it a lot. I have to say, I met some uh, very interesting people and some not very interesting people. <laughs> and then that's life, isn't it? You know. But, uh, but the uninteresting ones uh, really were my wife, who was sitting next to me, <laughs> and uh, other actors and so on, who were also trying to do what I do. But the, but, uh, the general public, um, the people I met, were absolutely lovely. So we've had a great day and been uh, quite busy, seeing a lot of costumes. The problem is, when you're as old as I am, um, you see some fantastic costumes, and you have no idea what they represent, <laughs> what show they're in. So you have to spend the day asking, what show are they in? And of course they look at you in a pitying way, as if you've never seen these things. But uh, I was never much of a comic reader when I was a kid. And I think I got the Beano. The Beano. That's about where it stopped, but I, I, I wasn't into sort of superheroes at all. Or anything. Uh, exactly, yes. Yeah. I, no, I agree. I actually agree about that. Obviously, um, you have had some flirtations with Doctor Who. But you are it's well a, known. It's a lie. I never flirted with Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> but you are well known for voicing from Only Fools and Horses. Yeah. Is that right, ladies and gents? Yeah. Yes, Only Fools and Horses. So, what's it like coming to a convention then, with that being your main uh, pull? Well, actually, uh, if, you, if you mentioned Doctor Who, I do have a slight sort of uh, tenuous connection with sci-fi, in that I did a quite a famous Doctor Who a long, long time ago with Tom Baker, who was the Doctor. Uh, it was called Seeds of Doom. Uh, it had a, recently resurfaced on, uh, on DVD. And uh, we did a little, sort of, a few extra things on it, which was terrific to meet the guys again. And it reminded me um, that Doctor was one of the happiest jobs I ever did. Uh, Tom Baker was, uh, was great to work with. It had a lot of laughs. And uh, at some stage, you know, when the, when the weather was bad, and we were running about filming, we couldn't film because the weather was so bad, so we had to stay indoors. And uh, so we'd uh, sit around a, a roaring electric fire and tell each other lies, uh, stories, and, uh, and, and a sort of unofficial impersonation um, school started. Everyone was doing their favourite impersonation. At the time, I did, uh, I did a fair impersonation of a big hero of mine, Jimmy Stewart. And I remember the film he did called The Flight of the Phoenix uh, with Hardy Kruger. He crashed an aeroplane in the desert and they were trying to put it back together again so they could fly out of there because no one was going to rescue them. And he used to argue with Harley Kruger and he had one line I remember which was, Listen, mister, I remember a time when we used to take a real pride in just getting there. And I remember this and, uh, and I did this as my impersonation. And Tom Baker, he loved this line. He said, and he got me to say it over and over again on a regular basis, sometimes in the middle of a Doctor Who scene. You know, which was uh, not what he was supposed to do. And years later, we met in uh, Soho, and uh, we're standing there, sort of shooting the breeze, talking about the old times. And uh, he said, "Oh yes, yeah, it was wonderful, wonderful times we had." He said, "He said, by the way, you're still doing that impression of Jimmy Stewart. I've never forgotten." He said, "Do it for me just once more, will you?" So there I am in the middle of Soho, going, "Listen, Mister, I remember a time when we used to take a real pride in just getting there." And just then, a bloke walked past us, and he did this enormous double take, tripped over the pavement, and fell flat in his face. <laughs> so I've let down to pick him up, so are you all right, mate? He said, he's, he's dusting himself off, and he says, he says, yeah, blimey, Boise doing Jimmy Stewart talking to Doctor Who, how often do you say that? <laughs> and he's gone off down on Compton Street, you know, sort of shaking his head, going, I don't believe that. <laughs> And years later, in fact, just a couple of years ago, I was doing a, a new Doctor Who story called uh, The Trouble with Drax. And uh, on radio this time, the idea is that you, uh, they're going to go a lot of old Doctor Who scripts together, using all the, uh, the old Doctors. Uh, they're doing these new stories. So there I am, back in the studio with Tom Baker, uh, just like it was 30-odd years ago. Um, I'm being a terrible henchman, threatening him with, with everything. He's played a doctor, very dark, very intense, sort of quiet scene, threatening scene. 
right in the middle of it, Tom Baker goes, you still didn't that impression of Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> Do it for me just once more, will you? I never forgot it. So, so they're in the studio in the middle of Sussex going, listen, mister, I remember a time. I want you to take a real pride in just going there. And I look through the glass and the script editor is going, where the hell is that line? <laughs> Who wrote this? I mean, it's fantastic sort of end of the story. You know. But anyway, that was uh, Doctor Who and that was a favourite job, as I have to say. And uh, yeah, so what were we talking about? <laughs> Sorry. Who cares? That was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. We are um, a couple of, well, we're a few things, but one of the things we are is um, YouTubers. And oh, yeah, yeah, YouTubers, yeah. I don't know if you know much about them, they like playing games and asking questions and quizzes. So okay. my friend here, Kaz, She's got a couple of questions. Hi, boy, <laughs> Sorry, sorry, John. I'm She's just, a little bit starstruck as well. Well, I, I've just got to say, it's like, I mean, I know you've done lots of things, but Only Fools and Horses ran from at least 81 to 91, and then all the way up till, uh, was it 2003, those Christmas specials. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just such a massive part of, um, of our lives. I'm sure I'm speaking to, uh, speaking on behalf of a lot of the audience as well. Um, and it just must be amazing to, to to kind of be on the other side of that and to be a part of that. It must just be like unbelievable for you, really. Yeah, well, it's the, the, the luckiest thing in the world, really. I because uh, I, I got the part of the voice. A lot of people ask me, you know, if I auditioned for it. I actually didn't at all. But uh, luckily. Um, I, was, I was actually in America at the time, I got seduced by America and I thought that's where the future lay and I was trying to stay out there. But my agent uh, said, you've been offered a part in a new comedy series called Citizen Smith. Don't know if you remember that, um, Power of the People, Wolfie Smith and all the great series. Well this was written by uh, a man called John Sullivan, it was his first hit series. And I just uh, came out to do one episode uh, playing a rather dodgy policeman. And I played an awful lot of policemen my time, mainly because I was so tall and good looking, you know, <laughs> why you laugh, why you laugh, uh, but I thought what can I do that's different about this policeman, and I just remembered uh, a guy I used to know in a pub, and he had this curious pedantic way of talking, very nasal, like this, you know, and very, very deliberate, to make his points, you know, so I thought this would fit quite well with the policeman, and so that's how I played the policeman, and uh, the result was John Sullivan, came up to me after the, the show and he said, he said, I really like that uh, character, he said, I'm going to try and use it again one day. And I thought, well, well that's very nice, thank you very much, but I thought no more of it, you know, because people say all sorts of things in this uh, business. And uh, um, the following year, I was trying to become a serious actor. <coughs> yes, another failure. Oh, right, um, but I was at the National Theatre, my goal, the National Theatre, doing, doing sort, of, uh, sort of straight plays and stuff. And so I got home and the script came through the door and it was, uh, it was a new, a new co- Sorry, John. <laughs> right in the middle of my best story. How could you? Anyway, um, John, John, I'll just say I am... Oh yes, yes, okay. It's amazing. <laughs> and uh, there was a script and it was uh, from a producer director called Ray Butt, um, who I'd worked with before on Citizen Smith. And I went, oh. I, uh, I read it and it made me laugh. Uh, and it's called Only Fools and Horses, and it was written by John Sullivan, so it had come true, as it said. Can I just say as well, I'm sorry, I know it's not about me, but my, obviously there's loads of great um, quotes from Only Fools and Horses, but two of my favourite was actually in the scene with Elsie Partridge, when they're asking for someone called Audrey, Aubrey, and it's, and on Only Fools, it's the comic timing, and the way they delivered it, because obviously everyone's looking at each other, and yeah. Del Boy mouths it, and then you just come in, did you know it? Yes, no, yes, <laughs> yes, I do. Do you, do you know it? No, no, I can't no, forget no. it. No, that's right, that's right. That is, she starts off by saying, I've got a message from someone called Audrey. <laughs> no, no, Aubrey. And so everyone's looking at each other. And eventually the camera pulls back, and Boise says, I am here. <laughs> <laughs> And, sorry, and also in Miami twice when Del Boy gets on and, and you say, you smell like a... Do you know? I love that as well, sorry. Yes. Yeah, I was, I was a bit worried about that line really because I thought it was a bit rude. <laughs> but I suppose it's typical uh, Boise to say, uh, good 
God, Del Horny, you smell like a vegetarian's fart. <laughs> it's very, it's all slightly offended, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Do you think that we should maybe take it to the audience? Yeah, I think maybe let these guys ask some questions if they want. I'll, I'll you. sit next to you. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just watch her, wondering hands. Uh, name's Derek. Sorry. Hi, Derek. Hi. Right. Um, on TV today, the quality of situation comedies is somewhat variable. Do you think John Sullivan was the last of the great sitcom writers? Mm. Uh, yeah, yes, I do, but I would say that, wouldn't I? You know, um, because he, he, of course, not only uh, gave, uh, gave me a chance, and that series changed all our lives, really. Uh, everybody's life and by the end of it you will be saying uh, for so many of the cast done so much other work you know which we're quite proud of but we all decided that uh, whatever it was we did nothing would ever be as famous or mean as much uh, to the people or be as good as that you know and uh, that's what you have to live with but I mean what a, what a legacy to have you know and uh, <clears throat> unfortunately John passed away about five years ago which uh, Suddenly, which I can't believe, you know, because he was also responsible for uh, the spin-off, which Boyce and Marlene did, called The Green Green Grass. You know? um, and he uh, he had that idea because I, with my wife, had moved out of London to Herefordshire, because usually you'd see me in London, obviously, and there I was in the middle of the country, in the middle of nowhere. And he said that uh, he'd been completely inspired by the fact that I'd made this move out of London. And he'd seen me out of context. He said, I wonder what would happen if Boise did the same as John has done. And, uh, and that's how it happened. Hey. Um, in Green Green Grass, uh, series four, there's one episode that the BBC have not allowed to be on the DVD. Uh, unfortunately, I've never seen that episode, and only some people here have. Can you just kind of describe what happens in that for us? Uh, what, what happens in it? It's the one uh, where. Where uh, th again, this is John Sullivan picking up a stuff, and uh, because I was writing my autobiography at the time, and he said, "Well, okay, well, Boyce is going to write his autobiography," and you know, it's full of full of stuff and full of uh, you know, <clears throat> full of the embellished incidents in his life, setting himself up as a, as a really uh, really interesting man, you know, um, and it was it was quite a funny idea, I thought, but I don't know why it's never come out. Um, I think it's a copyright problem somewhere. It may be, I think it may be a musical thing, because he was always using music, um, and knowing John was trying to find a way to get around not paying for it. So yeah. anyway, I'm sorry. It's a bit disappointing. I don't know the answer to it at all because nobody sold it. But I think it's about copyright, of some sort. Thank you. Thank you very much. So just to finish on then, John, can you tell these guys where they can find you next? What you've got planned for the future? Yes, what have I got planned for the future? You've got two uh, books uh, out, haven't you? Oh yes, oh yes. I've got, yes, I, uh, there are two copies of my autobiography, uh, Being Boise and Boise and Beyond. I've also written two novels, which is semi-autobiographical, about a new character called Reggie, who's me, really, and a bit of Boise and a bit of another character I know. Um, but he, he dresses like a toff and he's got a mouth like a truck driver. And it's called uh, Reggie, a stag at bay, and uh, Reggie in the frame. And I've got... Uh, I've got those two novels out as well, so I've been doing quite a bit of writing. Just about to go off and do two more episodes of Benidorm, so that'll be great fun. I don't know if anybody's been to Benidorm. Yep. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, it's just 24 hour party time, and uh, magic. I think it's such a joyous place, though. I really do. Everybody's having such a good time. So. And I've done an episode of, a uh, new episode of uh, Are You Being Served? Remember that John Eamon series? I'm free. That one, do you remember that? And if that goes well, we're hoping to do a series of it next year. So uh, I play uh, Captain Peacock. And just to finish, John, can we have that uh, famous line one last time, please? Which one was that? Vegetarian's <laughs> <laughs> fart. <laughs> no, Marlene. Can we have Marlene one last time? In your best uh, voice. Come along, Marlene. Get your coat. We're leaving. <laughs> Thank you, thank you ladies and thank you all for coming and uh, thank you all for watching the show. Great to be here, thanks.